I've been slowly working my way through covering some of the definitive works of the magical girl genre, which I love, but often feel are overlooked or under-discussed for one reason or another, and I hope to eventually be able to cover all of my favorites. But unlike Revolutionary Girl Utena or Princess Tutu or Sailor Moon, which I absolutely adore, my feelings on Cardcaptor Sakura are way more of a mixed bag. There are many unique and clever aspects that Cardcaptor Sakura has in its quiver that make it an undeniable standout Magical Girl series, and those aspects are absolutely worthy of praise. But it also has some truly awful story choices that can potentially ruin the entire viewing experience. Which makes it kind of complicated for me to talk about this series in a typical review format. How do I acknowledge the series' accomplishments for the landscape of the magical girl genre and LGBT representation, while also at the same time addressing some of the harmful, problematic romantic relationships portrayed? Especially when all of those aspects vary immensely between the manga, anime, and dub. Which means there's a lot to cover here. 12 volumes of manga, 70 episodes of anime, and two movies, in addition to the currently ongoing sequel Clear Card, which at the time of the release of this video covers another 10 volumes of manga and a 22-episode anime. My last month and a half has just been spent consuming Cardcaptor Sakura media, which is not how I would recommend any anime viewing experience, but especially something like Cardcaptor Sakura, which is better viewed a little bit at a time. I'm going to try to compartmentalize my feelings and unpack everything one at a time, starting with the good, then bad, and then talk about the series as a whole and not just the sum of its parts. So sit down, get yourself a nice drink, and buckle up for a long, weird episode. All roads lead to Sailor Moon. Cardcaptor Sakura is actually one of the progenitors of the mid-90s post-Sailor Moon Magical Girl boom, and is now largely considered to be one of the early redefining classics of the Magical Girl genre. It's important to note that Sailor Moon didn't invent the Magical Girl genre, it just redefined what the genre could be. Before the 90s, there were only a handful of Magical Girl series being released each year. But Sailor Moon basically revitalized the genre by combining the Sentai team format with Monster of the Week battles, it made the anime more action-oriented and created a broader appeal for both girls and boys. And its subsequent popularity ushered an increase in Magical Girl series being adapted into anime. Actually, a lot of Magical Girl series are unfairly accused of being ripoffs of Sailor Moon, which just isn't a fair statement. Don't get me wrong, there were definitely a couple of series that tried to ride off of Sailor Moon's success. Like, the anime adaptation of Akazakin Cha Cha added in a Magical Girl transformation sequence that wasn't in the original manga. And Wedding Peach's Magical Girl outfits were changed in the anime to more closely resemble the silhouette of Sailor Moon's outfits, along with several of the accessories, like changing the design of this tiara and adding a unified brooch on the chest. But otherwise, when I see these lists online still being published as recently as this year about the top 10 Sailor Moon ripoffs, I can't help but feel that it's a reductive argument. Especially when one of the examples given is My Hime. My Hime is a battle royale where teen girls fight each other with kaijus, it's not even technically a magical girl series. And the evidence cited for some of these examples is that they both have elemental powers or a secret identity or saving the world, when that's not an aspect unique to Sailor Moon. They share similarities because those themes are a staple for the genre. And if you break a genre down to its bare bones, you're gonna get a lot of similar looking skeletons. It'd be like saying all superheroes are a ripoff of Superman because they wear spandex and fight crime, like, come on. Sailor Moon's popularity definitely opened the door for and created a space for more Magical Girl series to receive anime adaptations. That much is definitely true. But I don't think it's fair that Cardcaptor Sakura is labeled as a Sailor Moon ripoff, even if it did benefit from Sailor Moon's success. The Cardcaptor Sakura manga was created in 1996 by Clamp, a very successful all-female manga artist group composed of the leader and writer Nanase Okawa and three artists whose roles shift for each series, Mokona, Tsubaki Nekoi, and Satsuki Igarashi. What's kind of unusual for most manga artists is that Clamp has never really stuck to one target demographic or genre, and have written series that are marketed towards girls, boys, and older adults. Some of their notable works include Chobits, Holic, and Tsubasa Reservoir Chronicles. 
Around when they were finishing wrapping up their previous work, Magic Knight Ray Earth, which was being serialized in the magazine Nakayoshi, Clamp's editor asked them to make another series for the magazine. Nakayoshi is one of the longest-running shoujo manga magazines, meaning the target demographic is around 10 to 12-year-old girls. Princess Knight and Sailor Moon were both originally serialized in Nakayoshi. But Magic Knight Ray Earth isn't really your typical shoujo manga series. While it does have some magical girl elements, it more closely falls into the genres of isekai, mecha, and swords and sorcery. And because Magic Knight Ray Earth was a bit unconventional, Clamp decided to make their next work something more traditionally in the realm of shoujo manga and make a magical girl series, which would end up being one of the defining works of the genre. You know, no biggie. A summary. Sakura Kinamoto is a 10-year-old girl who stumbles upon an ancient magic book called The Clow, breaks the seal and releases the magic cards held within, and now she is the only one who can collect them all and stop them from wreaking havoc and bringing disaster upon the world. The cast includes Karo, the Beast of the Seal and mascot character, Sakura's best friend and fashion-slash-film fanatic Tomio, her rival Lee Sharon, her older brother Toya, and his best friend Yukito. Each story arc generally follows the pattern of the sudden appearance of a mysterious transfer student who has some nebulous connection to the creator of the cloud cards, Cloud Reed, and they start causing trouble for Sakura. Sakura has a cryptic prophetic dream about meeting that person, a character is worried about something happening in the future that will hurt someone dear to them, and they vocalize it through unintelligible half sentences. And at the end, Sakura averts a world ending calamity after collecting or changing the cloud cards. No pressure. It's pretty standard magical girl fare by now, again, because it did cement some of these tropes, in hindsight they seem more cliched. Sakura being a solo magical girl may seem kind of unusual now, considering that team units are a staple of the genre because it creates the maximum opportunity for the theme of friendship is magic, but at the time it wouldn't have been as unusual. Before Sailor Moon, magical girls were usually solo units. Although Sakura does eventually acquire several magical companions, her rival and love interest Sharon actually makes them more like a magical duo, similar to Utena or the original Pretty Cure. There are actually a couple of things that immediately stand out when compared to other magical girl series, such as the obvious occult aspect. Like, the cloud cards are clearly inspired by tarot cards, Sakura's wand functions as a witch's broom, and the visual design of Sakura's magic circle. All of these aspects give the series a certain witchy flavor that I'm a big fan of aesthetically. Another instantly recognizable clampism is the wide variety of fashion styles that they dress their characters in. One of the most prominent styles being used is the classic Lolita fashion style, which is itself inspired by the Victorian and Edwardian fashion and features lots of cute, over-the-top poofy dresses. Or Clamp will also create looks that are more fantasy-inspired or just straight-up cosplay, some of which, shall we say, are more successful than others, and leave it at that. One such style that has to be one of my personal favorites, which, yes, does apparently exist, is Jestercore, which is like the perfect midpoint if you fused a wizard with a clown. And I'm livid that this concept art that's like a cat witch never made it into the actual series. Robbed. Robbed, I say. Give me magical girl wizard howl. I don't know, y'all. There's just something about it that deeply appeals to the part of me that loves Kirby, wizards, and absolute clown town fashion. Frankly, at this point, I don't know what you guys were expecting. The point is, Clamp already liked playing dress up with their characters. So when the decision came to design Sakura's transformation outfit, Clamp decided to give her multiple looks. The in-universe explanation being, Sakura's friend Tomoyo makes all of the battle costumes herself, and likes coming up with different themes and ideas. In an interview with one of the artists, Mokona estimates that she designed maybe 300 costumes, of which about two-thirds of those were Sakura's which meant that when the series was being adapted into an anime, the standard stock transformation slash attack sequence that is usually reused for multiple episodes to save time and money had to be reanimated for every new outfit. Which is very impressive, and from a marketing perspective, it's a really clever move because the figures basically make themselves. And even if you didn't like all of her outfits, you were more likely to have one of them end up being your personal favorite. Let me know in the comments what your favorite outfit is. Obviously, mine has to be this black and pink catgirl outfit, even though this Prince one is a close second. So that's the general vibe of the series, but depending on which version you're familiar with, your impression of the series is going to be really different, because the way the English dub was handled is absolutely wild. Card Captors 
Like a lot of late 90s and early 2000s anime, Cardcaptor Sakura received a heavily edited and censored kid-friendly English dub. The Nelvana dub was licensed for TV in North America and aired on the Kids WB, Toonami, and Nickelodeon in the early 2000s. Of which, despite having dubbed all 70 episodes and releasing them in other English-speaking territories, America only got 39 of them. There's some very standard early 2000s localization, changing the names to English, adding in a new musical opening, cutting out references to Japanese foods or culture, or any allusion to same-sex relationships. You know, the usual. But what isn't standard is trying to elevate the rival character into protagonist status. To be fair, Sharon is already the series' deuteragonist, the secondary main character role that is often reserved for rivals and love interests. But when it came to marketing the show in the West, in a further attempt to appeal to boys, the title of the series Cardcaptor Sakura was shortened into just Cardcaptors. They took the title character's name out of the title and changed it from the singular Cardcaptor, as in there is only one, into the plural Cardcaptors. Some very early promotional videos even listed Lee's name before Sakura, which was done to make him seem more important. The cards have escaped, unleashing chaos on the world. Now, Lee and Sakura must capture them. And this didn't happen by accident. An article in the Los Angeles Times from 2003 revealed, John Hardman, senior vice president for Kids WB Programming, insisted that the changes in bringing card captors to the American network were minor. We asked them to take the female hero's name out of the title and turn it into a more gender-neutral title that wouldn't turn away our core boy audience. We did ask them to pull back a level on some of the romantic relationships. They also rearranged the episode airing order. The Volume 1 VHS tape, Tests of Courage, starts with all Sharon heavy episodes. The first episode is his introduction episode, which originally was episode 8. Then the episode where Sharon collects his first cloud card, and the last episode is another Sharon heavy episode. And what's amazing about all of this is that while they were putting all of this effort into supplanting Sakura as the main character of her own series with a supporting male character, is that they also decided to edit her personality so that they could make her a strong female character. In response to anime fans' criticism about dubbing changes, specifically the choice to have Sakura's voice be lower, Hardman's explanation is, This Sakura is feistier. She's an empowered female, not only to attract girls, but to make sure boys realize she's someone they should aspire to befriend. Which is like, how exactly did they make her more empowered anyway? If we compare the new intro episode, episode 8, Sakura's Rival, and the changes they made to Sakura's character, mainly they just made Sakura more vocally direct when Sharon is being mean to her. Are you okay? It was nothing I couldn't handle myself. Boy, you are hopeless. Back off. Yeah. Serves you right. Or about how her outfit is dumb because she doesn't like pink frills. Sakura is not like other girls. But pink frills, Madison? It's not pink, it's Cyber Rose. The thing is, it's not like Sakura is a pushover to begin with. When Sharon tries to take the cards from her, she stands up to him and refuses to give them to him. And admitting that she's scared of thunder doesn't make her any less brave when she captures it anyway. The strong female character argument really does not work when people keep equating being nice or non-confrontational or traits that are typically considered to be feminine with weakness. And while the American dub really crossed the line in trying to make Sharon more important, the original anime adaptation kind of did the same thing, just not to the same extent. Because in the manga, Sakura is unquestionably the only person who can capture the cards, but the anime changed it so that whoever defeats the card collects it which firmly cements Sharon as Sakura's rival, which is kind of sad considering he only ends up with about nine cards anyway. I'm not actually sure how I feel about this change in the anime to let Sharon also collect cards, especially retroactively with some events that have unfolded in clear card. I think it depends on if you prefer action and conflict-driven narratives, or if you prefer stories about interpersonal relationships and peaceful problem solving. On the one hand, 
It is kind of annoying to have a series that was made for girls and their interests to become more conflict-driven in an attempt to appeal to boys, when there's already a lot of media for boys, and the same thing would never happen in reverse. Like, could you imagine if a commercial for Dragon Ball was like, Coming this fall, join Bulma and Goku as they search to collect the seven Dragon Balls. Like, that would be weird. But at the same time, I like Sharon as a character, and this change gives him a little bit more agency and more to do in the story, so I think both choices ultimately are fine, it just depends on your preferences. And I know in theory I should be mad at the Cardcaptor's dub for trimming down so much, but honestly there is something to say for cold opening in the middle of a story, and having everything move at a brisk pace instead of a leisurely stroll. And nostalgia blind or not, I still definitely have a soft spot for it. But speaking of Sharon being able to collect the cloud cards, let's actually talk about the cards themselves. The magic system for Cardcaptor Sakura is unusually good for a Magical Girl series, and I don't think it gets enough credit for that. Typically, the way most Magical Girl powers work is that they have some magical object that they channel a specific attack through, which is almost always ambiguous elemental energy, be that light, fire, or water, and that makes for a very weak battle sequence. Most fight scenes consist of the enemy beating the magical girl for five minutes until she remembers to believe in herself or that she can do magic, and then her stock attack disintegrates the enemy. 99% of magical girl battles play out like that. But Sakura is a little bit different because she has this arsenal of specialized moves. In each episode, we, the audience, get to see the full extent of the card's power when it's running rampant, and then how Sakura utilizes it to capture other cards. And it creates an interesting little mystery for the audience on a first watch to try and figure out what kind of card is causing trouble, and then a satisfying reward to see how Sakura can use them for good. Sometimes the solution for capturing a card isn't as simple as using another card to beat it, and she has to get creative and use her head. Each card has a specialized function, but also a personality and weakness related to its identity. The flower is a gentle card, but the sword is aggressive in nature. There's also a hierarchy system that unfortunately isn't really explored in a satisfying way where the audience has enough information to be able to predict an outcome. Each card is either under the jurisdiction of the sun or moon, and then again under the light and dark, and then the four base elemental cards. The hierarchy system will pop up sometimes in reference to one or two cards, but not in any comprehensive way, and sometimes the information is conflicting depending on if it's coming from the anime or manga. When it comes to hard and soft magic systems, Cardcaptor Sakura is still very soft, it just feels harder in comparison to other Magical Girl series. Frankly, I wish more Magical Girl series used a more concrete magic system. And while this is another element that distinguished Cardcaptor Sakura from other Magical Girl anime, the anime made some changes, or more accurately, additions. If you've ever thought to yourself, boy, there sure are a lot of water-based cards that seem completely redundant when you have the base elemental card, the watery, well, that's because they are redundant. The anime has a total of 52 cards, but the manga only had 19. Remember, the Cardcaptor Sakura manga was first being published in 1996, which coincidentally happened to be the same year a little company called Nintendo published this newfangled game called Pocket Monsters. You might have heard of it. It's the highest grossing media franchise in the world. The Pokemon anime aired on April 1997 in Japan, and Cardcaptor Sakura followed a year later. And while I can't really say how much, if any, Pokemania had on the development of Cardcaptor Sakura's anime, the Kids WB really wanted Cardcaptors to be the new Pokemon. The Kids WB, which was already airing Pokemon, really leaned into the card collection aspect as being a major draw for the series, which explains the sort of pseudo poke rap in the opening, and even what appears to be a section highlighting a specific card, like the Who's That Pokemon commercial bumper. But it makes no sense, because unlike Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh, there's no tie-in game for kids to actually buy. No one was buying individual cloud cards or blind packs. Even if you did convince your parents to buy you a replica cloud book at your local blockbuster as a child and then treasure it forever, that was a one-time transaction. It's not functional as a multi-level collectathon franchise at all. So it doesn't make any sense to market it as one. And the anime adding extras not only made some cards redundant, but meant that they were sometimes only used once after being captured, and often only in their debut episode. 
Out of the 33 new cards that they added, including a movie original card, 13 of those are never used at all. More than doubling the amount of cards Sakura has to collect screams of filler, and literally half of the first arc is filler. Similarly, Meilin was invented for the anime to add drama, but she's given very little personality-wise and even less to do in the narrative. She has a really strong introduction. She doesn't have any magic but is able to physically hold her own against a card, which is really impressive and would set her up to be the tank of the series, but afterwards she's just completely underutilized. She just gets in the way and becomes a conflict generator that's in love with Shaoran, which is not what this series needed. That doesn't mean that she's a bad character, and it's not like I dislike her, she just doesn't really add anything. You can skip the filler episodes and miss basically nothing. The pacing of the anime is already a bit slow, and the filler just grinds the progression of the plot to a crawl. If you're planning to rewatch the series for nostalgia, these are the only two episodes I think shouldn't be skipped. Overall, the smaller deck of only 19 cards makes them much easier to keep track of mentally. I can roughly remember the manga original cards' designs and skill set and how Sakura managed to capture them, which is good because one of the important things about Sakura collecting the cards is that, while she's keeping the world safe from them, she's also befriending them in the process. Whether that's through kindness for gentle cards like Windy or Flower, or proving herself worthy through a test of strength for more temperamental cards like the Fiery and the Sword. Okay, maybe not all of them are bosom buddies, like somehow I doubt the maze holds any fond feelings for Sakura, but the humanoid ones clearly do at least. By adding so many extra cards, the anime lessens this aspect of befriending the cards being important. Like Sakura for sure thunderbolted some of these cards in the anime, and it really adds to the series feeling like a soulless collectathon. Putting flaws and filler aside, I do love the eventual motto Sakura uses during times of crisis, which is the assurance, I'm sure I'll be alright. I think that's a really empowering and good message for kids, to believe in themselves and not despair and give up when facing adversity. Even if you feel terrible or something awful happens, that you will be able to overcome it and you will be fine. It's a concept that I personally find very comforting, which is why I have a similar statement for my atro, which, fun fact, actually comes from this vine. I can predict the future, and you're going to be okay. But what is possibly Cardcaptor Sakura's greatest strength comes from how it handles the writing of the main love interest character, the rival character, and the love rival for the protagonist, in that they're all the same person. Love Rivals. So, in the beginning of the series, Sakura has a one-sided crush on Yukito, who is the best friend of her older brother, and Shaoran also has a one-sided crush on Yukito. And from a writing perspective, that's really clever to have the rival character also be the protagonist's rival on the battlefield of love, and to then have those characters eventually fall for each other. The full potential for that character dynamic is incredible and just wasted if you write all of your characters to be straight by default. For the late to mid-90s, this was very progressive and was in an animated show for kids no less. Something similar kind of happened much later by accident in The Legend of Korra in 2014, where there was a love triangle between the characters Korra, Mako, and Asami where after a very troubled production and unclear information about how many seasons they would actually get, the writers rushed Mako and Korra into a relationship at the end of season one, when, surprise, they were renewed for more seasons and weren't sure how to continue a rushed, prematurely concluded romantic subplot. Basically, by the end of the series, the writers had burned through every other possibility of Korra or Asami dating and breaking up with Mako multiple times. And the series ended instead with Korra and Asami holding hands and going off into the proverbial sunset together. Which, to its credit, at the time was the closest thing Nickelodeon would allow to depicting an explicit same-sex relationship and had to be confirmed independently afterwards by the writers that Korra and Asami were indeed a couple. And the implied gay ending was only allowed by Nickelodeon because that last season was being released through online streaming and not being broadcast on television. If you ever look up the very short list of bi characters in anime by decade from the 1960s to 80s, there are only two listed bi characters, and they're both from the Rose of Versailles. But in the 1990s, there are 11. 
and six of those are from Revolutionary Girl Utena, but the other two are from Cardcaptor Sakura. If you managed to read the manga when you were a kid like I did or the original Japanese anime, this was some of the only thing close to explicit bi representation in an animated series for kids that we were going to get for years. Like, growing up with Sailor Moon, I knew that Uranus and Neptune were a couple because everyone online said they were. But when you're a kid used to consuming heteronormative media, you have a very clear idea of what a couple is supposed to look like in an animated series. Flowers will appear on screen, they'll blush around each other, and there will be a confession scene and they'll kiss. You know, explicit, undeniable cues that these characters are in love. And that didn't happen with Uranus and Neptune the way it did for other characters in the series. I knew they were in love, but I didn't see that they were in love. Because when you're 10 or whatever, cues and lines like these go completely over your head. But Sharon's crush on Yukito using all of the same cues as Sakura's crush made it really clear to the audience what was happening. Like, I have never seen gay panic more perfectly illustrated than in this one scene. And what's almost even more impressive for a manga being released in 1996 is that it's, like, just not a big deal. No one ever demeans Sharon for having a crush on a boy, Sakura never outs him, she treats him like a genuine rival. No one ever says that, well, he can't have a crush on Yukito because they're both boys. Sakura and Sharon even have a late night conversation where Sharon accidentally admits for the first time aloud that he also likes Yukito, and it's just a very sweet bonding moment between them. Having a crush on the same person also illustrates how similar Sakura and Sharon are when competing for his affections, and it makes their eventual romance make more sense. In an interview after the completion of the manga, Clamp's head writer, Okawa, basically confirms that she deliberately wrote Sakura that way. I wanted a story with a protagonist who had an open mind towards different family structures, different kinds of love, and different perspectives from society. For example, when she found out that Sharon was in love with Yukito, she didn't look at him strangely. She did consider him a rival, but she didn't act as though it was weird. Queer representation is actually one of the things that Clamp really excels at. Even just in Cardcaptor Sakura, there are multiple instances of LGBT representation. Toya and Yukito are in love, Tomio has a one-sided, absolutely selfless love for Sakura that values Sakura's happiness above all. Ruby Moon is genderless but prefers to present as feminine and uses she-her pronouns. In the same interview, Okawa also explained that the reason Sakura didn't fall in love with Tomio isn't because they're both girls, and that Sakura would have fallen in love with Sharon no matter what regardless of gender because of the kind of person he was. Which, if that's true, would also make Sakura either possibly bi or pan or demi-romantic, meaning she only develops romantic feelings after forming an emotional bond with an individual over a long period of time. That very casual acceptance of same-sex romance by Clamp Personally, it's very hard for me to talk about, because as a bi kid growing up in the 90s, this was one of the very, very few instances in media where I felt seen and positively represented, and I will always be grateful for that. I can't understate how important that is. Uh, however, however... That unfortunately leads me to the rest of Clamp's non-judgmental nature when it comes to love, and with that being said, I gotta talk about the elephant in the room. Clamp, love is love, and censorship. Clamp is, you know, they're what you could describe as a problematic fave. It's always one step forward and two steps back with them. One of the themes that pops up frequently in Clamp's work is the concept of pure love or true love. Soulmates is a big theme, and in the larger Clamp universe, there's something called soul pairs. If a couple is a soul pair in Clamp's universe, if they reappear in a different series, they have to appear together and cannot be separated. And the exploration of different kinds of love is a major theme in Cardcaptor Sakura. Familial love, childhood crushes, and unrequited love. And Clamp is really into the concept of a true love that is so powerful it defies any potential barriers such as gender or status or age, and isn't motivated by other aspects like sexual desire. That last example is explored more in depth in their other work, Chobits. Which is a fine concept in a vacuum, but when put into practice, unfortunately ends up being a double-edged sword. 
For every good, unapologetic depiction of a queer romance, there's also like three other romances that are gonna leave a sour taste in your mouth. Sakura and Sharon having a crush on Yukito, who is a good seven years older than them, is... I personally don't like it, but it's fine. Out of everything we're about to cover, it bothers me the least. For one thing, it's clearly nothing more than puppy love on Sakura and Sharon's end. It's not like they're trying to actually date Yukito, they just get all bubbly when he's around. There's even the implication that their initial crush is at least partially motivated by moon magic. But more importantly, Yukito is just a nice dude who's not at all romantically interested in either of them and treats Sakura like a younger sister. It's basically harmless. Which unfortunately is a little less true for Sakura's parents' relationship. At the beginning of the series, it's revealed that Sakura's mom, Nadeshko, passed away at age 27 when Sakura was 3 and Toya was 10. Which means she was pregnant with Toya around when she was 17 or 16, which was when Sakura's father married her when he was a 25-year-old teacher and she was one of his students. And the way that Clamp tries to justify this is by writing them as soulmates. When these characters pop up in other Clamp works, they're a soul pair, and that even if they had met when she was 20 or 30, that they would have fallen in love all the same. In another interview, one of the artists stated, In our opinion, the fact that a young bride is unopposable because of love makes her a lovable presence. From their standpoint, marrying young is a romantic, possibly even empowering concept in fiction, and they're probably not thinking critically about how that message is going to impact their readership, who in regards to Nakayoshi, the magazine Cardcaptor Sakura is published in, again, are 10 to 12 year old girls. There's also the question of what is the age of consent in Japan, which, as we've discussed previously, varies from region to region, and in some cases is as low as 16. So, especially when you consider that these characters got married right away, for the time period and region, this relationship may not have been considered to be a crime at all. Which... fine, whatever. If these were the only two examples of this issue, then I could try to ignore them because on a casual viewing experience, it just doesn't come up very often unless you're actively doing the math. But on the other hand, it's just an inescapable theme with their work, and they just keep trying to one-up themselves. There's more! Like Kaho Mizuki being a student teacher and then dating Toya for like a year when he was in junior high! And then later in the manga becoming a couple with a character that is basically the male equivalent of a 1000 year old dragon waifu that, no, it's totally okay to date even though they look like a child. And then there's Rika, and I just, I don't know what Clamp was thinking here. Rika is 11, and the difference between Sakura's crush on Yukito and Rika's crush on her teacher is that in the manga, Rika's crush is reciprocated. They are secretly engaged. He is waiting until she grows up to marry her. And that's grooming which is maybe not a good thing to present uncritically, no, romantically framed even, when the target demographic of your reading audience is preteen girls. I'm not saying that every author has a moral obligation to their audience or that no one can tell a story that includes polarizing issues, but if the target audience is children, there have to be some safeguards at least. And actually, there are rules for what you can and cannot depict in a children's series, including manga and anime for a reason. For instance, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is known for some really graphic and violent imagery, and the versions that are streaming on Netflix and Crunchyroll are censored, unlike the Blu-ray release. Which infamously and hilariously also applied to delinquent 17-year-old Jotaro Kujo smoking a cigarette and caused his whole lower face to be censored because in Japan it's illegal to purchase tobacco products under age 20. Similarly, Yusuke from Yu Yu Hakusho had all references to him smoking scrubbed from the anime. There's even this small tidbit in the manga of Cardcaptor Sakura that was changed. In the manga, Yukito rides double on Toya's bike, which implies a certain level of closeness between them, which was changed in the anime to riding separate bikes because riding double is illegal. And by the way, this practice isn't exclusive to Japan. Most cartoons are subject to similar rules and restrictions on what can and cannot be aired to children in most places. 
In 2012, an episode of the British cartoon Peppa Pig had to be pulled from Australia because it featured Peppa befriending a spider and the lesson that spiders aren't dangerous, which is fine in the UK, but not in Australia where the spiders are nightmare creatures and in some cases can hurt you. Episode 35 of Pokemon The Legend of Dratini had to be banned entirely from the US due to the heavy and casual usage of guns, which is fine to show in Japan because Japan has the fewest gun deaths per year in the world. Japan has some of the strictest gun laws in the world and experiences 100 or fewer gun deaths per year in a population of over 127 million, which obviously doesn't apply to America because as of 2017, Gallup found that 42% of American households reported owning guns. And at this point, there are actually more guns than people in the United States. Common reasons for censorship is if something is deemed offensive, inappropriate, upsetting, or dangerous. If it's a real world danger a kid can imitate, there are steps to tone it down for safety reasons. Children aren't stupid, but they are influenced by the media they consume. Monkey see, monkey do. There's no harm in showing a character shoot a laser beam out of their finger because it isn't a real world action a child can imitate, but they can easily steal their parents' cigarettes or guns and play with them. Which is why the anime of Cardcaptor Sakura toned down the full scope of Rika's relationship with her teacher down by a lot. Her infatuation can be interpreted as a one-sided crush, and the engagement thing just straight up doesn't happen in the anime, even in the original Japanese. And the same goes with Mizuki's 1,000-year-old waifu, and that makes the anime way more palatable than the manga. Clamp has continued to do stuff with age gaps in later works like Chobits, but they definitely dialed it back a lot, and to my knowledge, nothing as bad as the Rika incident again. It also seems to only pop up in this period in the late 90s and early 2000s, and then not really again. It's not a theme in Holic or Subasa, which both ran for way longer than anything else Clamp has made. And in Clear Card, Rika is in a new school and there's been no mention of her dating anyone. Which makes me wonder if Clamp was either pressured to tone it down or just later changed their mind about it and retconned it. And with all of this information, I don't know if I can come to any strong conclusion about Clamp's authorial intent here. I don't think Clamp's stance on age gaps comes from a bad place or even necessarily applies to how they feel outside of fiction. Writing something in a story doesn't mean that the author would be okay with that action in reality, especially if it was a one-time thing that happened years ago and then never occurred again since then. Their authorial intent is that their characters' relationships aren't sexually motivated, and Clamp knows that to be true because they're the ones writing it. I think that's probably why they stress the concept of soulmates so much and characters falling in love despite their differences and not because of them. Actually, all of Clamp's members are unmarried and they have briefly mentioned that was something they had to actively sacrifice when choosing their careers, so I can imagine that's part of the reason why the concept of marrying young and for unstoppable love to them is endearing, and that they shouldn't be judged simply because they're unconventional. To return to Okawa's earlier statement that she wanted a story with the protagonist who had an open mind towards different family structures, different kinds of love, and different perspectives from society. When I hear that, part of me does understand what she's going for and where she's coming from. She's trying to tell a story with a protagonist that is non-judgmental, and her love and acceptance of others' differences are one of her greatest strengths as a character. And in theory, I agree with that statement. I think it's a great lesson, and when applied to queerness or unconventional family formations, I think that's one of Cardcaptor Sakura's greatest strengths. Sakura's acceptance of Sharon's crush on a boy is, like I said, one of the things I found really compelling and progressive, especially for the time it was being made. Unfortunately, that all kind of falls apart the moment she fully clarifies the full extent of what that statement applies to. For Cardcaptor Sakura, and I don't know if this is the right way to put it, but I wanted to write something that minorities would feel comfortable with. Depending on your point of view, Tomoyo-chan's feelings for Sakura could be considered dangerous. Similarly, you can see Yukito and Toya as being friends, or going beyond that. There's also how Sharon was, at first, attracted to Yukito, and Rika's feelings for Torada-sensei. 
I took great care in how to portray all that. And reading that makes me want to lose my fucking mind. Remember, this is a quote from 2001 in Japan where gay marriage still is not legalized and minorities often face discrimination. To be fair, they're still working on it. On March 17th of this year, 2021, a Japan court ruling found the ban on same-sex marriage as unconstitutional. So that's at least one piece of news to be hopeful about. And to circle back to Okawa's statement, this discrimination was something that she was aware of. Depending on your point of view, Tomoyo's feelings for Sakura could be considered dangerous. And that at least is true. Gay relationships have been historically censored from children's media because people have argued that they're somehow inappropriate or too sexual or dangerous to show to kids. This is why Uranus and Neptune were changed from lovers to cousins in the American dub. The best Korra could do at the time was hand-holding and a word of God confirmation. This scene from Steven Universe with Rose and Pearl dancing was heavily edited in the version released for the UK because it was considered to be too sexual. And even in 2018, Noelle Stevenson, the creator of the reboot she and the Princesses of Power on Netflix, had to resort to subterfuge on their own series in order to achieve the romantic ending between two of the main characters. My big fear was that I would show my hand too early and get told very definitively that I was not allowed to do this. I sort of had a plan and it was like, if I can get them to this place where their relationship and that romance is central to the plot, and it can't be removed, can't be noted out, or it can't be something that's cut later, then they'll have to let me do it." Stevenson said she worked to plant seeds over the course of several seasons weaving different threads that intertwined Adora and Catra's storylines to the point where it couldn't be anything else but romantic love. Once everything was in place and the crew had been informed, Stevenson told the executives her plan to end the series with Katra and Adora confirming their mutual feelings. The fight for positive LGBT representation is a constant, ongoing uphill battle. And the anime for Cardcaptor Sakura cut out this line where Tomio quietly reflects to herself that her feelings for Sakura are a little bit different than Sakura's feelings for her. And in the English dub card captors, all references to gay relationships were scrubbed from the series, as well as all age gap relationships. Which is just, it's so frustrating, no matter which side you look at. Because I do think it's better to cut, at the very least, the portrayal of Rika's relationship. It's naive to write a story where Rika's relationship is somehow an exception because she's mature for her age, and there's presumably no other insidious motivation on her teacher's part. Because, at the end of the day, no matter what the authorial intent is, what you end up with is the positive depiction where a child is in a romantic relationship with an adult, and that's not a safe story to tell to children. And it's painful to see both sides of this argument, both clamp and American censorship, treat gay relationships as if they were the same as Rika's relationship. It's painful that Clamp lumps them both under the same love is love umbrella of absolute acceptance. And it's painful that American censorship also handles them like they're equally harmful. When they're not the same. And I know there are people still out there today using the same argument that I would use to censor Rika's relationship because it's harmful as an excuse to censor all depictions of gay relationships. And that sucks and it sours all of my excitement and fondness for this series. Like, I can talk about all the positives all day long, but the moment you get to this, it's like, oh, right, this is what Clamp thinks. It makes the series really hard to revisit, let alone recommend to someone, because that's an obvious deal breaker for a lot of people. Which brings me to the question, can I even recommend Cardcaptor Sakura to anyone? And the answer is, maybe? It depends on which version you look at and using your own best judgment. The manga is the most overtly problematic and includes aspects like Tomio's mom, who was Nadeshko's cousin, being in love with Nadeshko. It's also the version that most explicitly reveals that Tomio is in love with Sakura. But that also establishes that Tomio is Sakura's second cousin. Like, okay, their families were estranged and they didn't know they were related until this reveal, but again, it's such a weird narrative choice. Like, Clamp, you know you didn't have to do that. 
I don't know, man. Sometimes canon is bad and you just have to ignore some aspects to enjoy a series, and this is an aspect that I choose to ignore because it just doesn't pop up very often. And if I don't actively ignore it, it becomes very weird. So despite the magic system being better and easier to manage with only 19 cards, and also providing a more in-depth explanation and satisfying conclusion for the end of the series, I can't really recommend the manga. The only real pro is that you can just quickly skim through the bad parts. And like I said before, the Nelvana dub fixes this by scrubbing away almost all references to age gap relationships and same-sex relationships. Which is kind of like, you decided it was fine to let Sakura have a crush on Yukito, but you cut out Toya and Yukito being boyfriends because that was the thing you found unacceptable. But also, like, it's an early 2000s dub, like, just listen to this. Hero, just how am I supposed to do this? First, transform it to its visible form. And that would be how? Heads up! Uh -huh. Hi, Lee! Hmm. Whatever. Hey! The chrominance reduction worked great! And yeah, that's completely unacceptable by today's standards. Unless you grew up with it and want to watch a couple episodes for nostalgic value, I can't really recommend the Nirvana dub. Which means that if I had to recommend one version, it would have to be the original anime. Because it does tend to hit somewhere in the middle, and it seems to be the version people are most familiar with anyway. At the end of the day, I think the anime is fine, but if you've never seen Cardcaptor Sakura, maybe just give it a pass? If you want, what you can do is just watch the second movie as a standalone, which is nicely well done and is sort of the prime Cardcaptor Sakura content, unlike the first movie which is just kind of boring and adds nothing. Overall, the original series is really fraught and I have a lot of complex feelings about it. I think because I did grow up with the manga, and I can't really divorce that aspect mentally from the rest of the series as a whole. But what about Clear Card? Well, I cannot understate to you how much no one was expecting Clear Card to happen. Let me paint a scene for you. In October 2000, after the manga had reached a natural and satisfying conclusion and Okawa confirmed the story was over and had no plans of making a sequel. In 2003, Clamp simultaneously serialized two manga that had an interconnected story, Pollock and Tsubasa Reservoir Chronicle. And Tsubasa was a shonen manga which featured alternate universe versions of Shaoran this time as the protagonist, and Sakura as the deuteragonist in Love Interest. As they traveled through multiple alternate universes based off of Clamp's other works, it was bonkers. Possibly one of the most convoluted things I've ever seen in my life, like it's right up there with Kingdom Hearts and Homestuck. It had time travel alternate universes, there were clones, there were time loops. I mean, seriously, just look at these timelines! Like, what the fuck is supposed to be happening here? It was a lot. And weirdest of all, because Cardcaptor Sakura ended on a really happy note, especially when compared to Clamp's other works, Clamp was like, hey, you know what would be fun? Let's create alternate universe versions of these characters, have them already be in love and about to confess their feelings for each other, and then immediately rip them apart and set them up for a tragedy that they have to earn their way out of. Like, I'm not exaggerating. The premise of Tsubasa is that Sakura's memories have been shattered into a thousand pieces and scattered across the multiverse, and they have to travel through different dimensions to return them to her. And the problem with that is that the price Shaoran paid in order to travel between dimensions are all of Sakura's childhood memories of him. So even if they restore all of her memories and she returns to who she was before, she'll never be able to remember that they were childhood friends and that she was in love with him. She can still make new memories, but those old memories of him will always be staticked over. And Clamp did this for seven years, with Tsubasa ending in 2009 and Holic in 2011. Which is why in 2016, the announcement that Clamp was going to not be making a reboot, but an actual continuation of the original Cardcaptor Sakura series, I think everyone was completely caught off guard. And after all of that, I gotta admit, growing up with the series and 16 years later, seeing Sakura and Sharon, who they themselves had been separated for a year, finally be properly reunited, while the instrumental opening of the third season of the original anime, I Am A Dreamer, starts to swell in the background. <gasps> Ooh, I'm not gonna lie, that hit me pretty hard. Had me reeling a little bit. Just, just pure satisfaction. They did it. They finally made it. And you know what? I've been really enjoying Clear Cards so far. 
It's not perfect, but it does have a world-ending dragon, which in terms of stakes is more than I can say for the original series. And I'm really curious about what shenanigans Clamp is going to do next. Like I said in the beginning, Clear Card is still ongoing, and because of that, the anime is incomplete. It's the first half of a whole picture. So I can't really make a judgment on whether it's good or not yet, because there's still plenty of time for them to fuck everything up. And the Clear Card anime does have some of the same problems the original anime did, where the foreshadowing is way too heavy-handed for something that hasn't even happened in the anime yet, which is real frustrating. The anime and the manga both have separate pros and cons. Like, sometimes the fight scenes in the manga are just impossible to make out, like, what is supposed to be happening here? And the anime automatically fixes that problem by color blocking. Sakura finally got to collect a card in the anime by just politely asking if they'd like to become friends. The manga also has some direct references to Alice in Wonderland, which I'm aesthetically a big fan of. I don't know how much the anime is going to divert from the manga, so this may be just something that they're saving for another season, but the premise is, all of the cards have been turned clear and unusable. And in the manga, Sakura is really worried about them because, you know, they're her friends and she loves them. And that hasn't happened in the anime yet, and it makes her seem kind of callous in comparison, like the cards really are meaningless collectibles that can just be replaced. But I'm also worried that Clamp is going to follow through on what they couldn't before with Sakura's relationship with Yukito, and have Akiho's one-sided crush on an older boy actually come to fruition. I don't think his age has been confirmed in canon yet, and because of that, I'm choosing to believe he's only a couple of years older than her, and that there's some weird time travel thing going on that might make it more okay. That's the outcome that I am very cautiously optimistically hoping for, while at the same time completely ready to be proven wrong and once again disappointed. So, closing thoughts. I had a really hard time writing this script. Trying to examine the individual strengths and faults of this series all at once is like either getting a piece of candy or being hit by a rock. And at some point, I have to ask myself, is the candy worth being hit by rocks? And the thing is, at this point, I don't know. I think my opinion has been slightly colored by time restrictions and forcing myself to watch all of the filler after I had already recently rewatched the series for nostalgia. Also, passively consuming a series is a completely different experience from actively watching a series with the intent of making a critical analysis. So even if the flaws are a minor occurrence and don't really take up more than a couple of chapters or episodes, it would be weird if I didn't talk about it here. And again, when you're only focusing on the anime, it's not like the anime is terrible. Like, it's animated by Madhouse. The first episode is very cinematic and even suspenseful. And the aspects like the magical girl outfits and card collection and Sakura and Shaoran's relationship being really wholesome are worthwhile. There are even moments or episodes of filler that I did enjoy, like this moment where Karo and Shaoran swap bodies and they're trying to hide the fact that they've swapped from Tomio and then this happens. Hi, Bozu! <sighs> oh, yeah. Hi, yeah, buddy! <laughs> it's just, it's so absurd, it makes me laugh every time. But even that comes at the expense of having to sit through Sakura's will-they-won't-they they crush on Yukito, which isn't enjoyable and takes up a majority of the animated series. And the only thing that makes it bearable is that I know that it's a won't-they. I understand I am not this series' target demographic, like this show is for younger audiences, which means it needs to be easy to understand, but outside of a nostalgia, plot-wise, there's not really a lot to keep my focus. Sometimes canon is bad and you just have to ignore it to enjoy a series, but because I grew up with the manga, I have a harder time divorcing those aspects from the anime, even if they don't pop up explicitly in the text of the anime. Which means that there is a lot that I would have to try to consciously ignore with the series, and I may revisit it someday, but not anytime soon. I'm still nostalgic for parts of it, especially aesthetically. I still think Sakura is really cute, and there's a reason why I only ended up drawing her in cute outfits and just didn't bother with the rest of the cast. And I don't think there's anything wrong with people enjoying the anime or the imagery. When I was a kid, 
I needed Cardcaptor Sakura. It was the first time I had seen someone like me represented in a way that I understood, and that's great. Nothing will diminish how grateful I am for that. But when it comes to LGBT representation, there's better out there now. She-Ra, The Owl House, Steven Universe. Like, I'm so glad kids growing up now have these shows to look up to and see themselves in. And there are better Magical Girl series out there too. As it is now, I don't think Cardcaptor Sakura has really stood the test of time, and I'm fine with that. And I'm also going to end the video because I've been talking for like an hour at this point and I don't know how to end this. Thank you to my patrons. This video was made possible because of you. And welcome to my new patrons, Shiro the Nerd, Sarah, Phil Pestinger, Jigglypuff Noise, which I guess phonetically is supposed to be like, <laughs> Jigglypuff! Tai, Brusher, and Matthew McComer. Thank you for being so supportive and your patience. I really appreciate y'all. All right, I'm signing out, and I just want to let you know that everything's gonna be okay.